host for Motor Week, John Davis. Well, hello and welcome again to Motor Week. We're glad to have you with us. We're in Bowling Green, Kentucky at the National Corvette Museum, where this week we take a special look at the long-awaited fifth generation of Chevrolet's all-American sports car, the 1997 Corvette. Throughout its development, Chevrolet has been unusually tight-lipped, offering nary a peek at the new Corvette until it was officially unveiled at Detroit's Auto Show in January. Well, now the wraps are off and they reveal a car that's revolutionary in both form and substance. So the only question that remains is, will traditional loyal Corvette fans take up this new call to arms? It was way back in 1988 that the first rumors began circulating that a new Chevrolet Corvette was in the works, and they were true. But internal strife and financial upheavals kept the C5 project in development limbo for nearly eight years before ever seeing the light of day. But for all that time, Corvette lovers within GM labored in back rooms and basement studios, knowing that a project like the Corvette happens maybe once in a career. And this one was going to be done right, no matter what. From the beginning, chief designer John Cafaro had a vision of how the fifth generation Corvette should look. And by sticking to his guns, that vision is on the street today. The bold sweeping curves seemingly rise right from the ground in front and arc up to the aircraft inspired canopy. From there, a single dominant line encompasses the windshield roof and rear hatch. A sharp downward angle and forward reaching curve marks the rear design, almost willing the car into action. Taken overall, the shape appears clean and uncluttered, but look closer and many nuances in the design appear. The double bubble roof line, the aggressive side vent door treatment, and the high fenders and inward slope of the hood. The stretch styling doesn't appeal to everyone from all angles, but it says Corvette loud and clear and no one can fault that. Once the shape was decided upon, attention was focused on the chassis, and no GM car ever faced a tougher set of criteria. This Corvette was expected to be the bionic man of sports cars. Lighter, faster, stronger, roomier, and oh, by the way, cheaper. To accomplish that, Corvette engineers used a lightweight steel space frame with a central backbone-like tunnel. The single-piece side rails are set low for easier access to the cockpit and making the cockpit floor from a sandwich of fiberglass and balsa wood added tremendous stiffness and made the car lighter and quieter to boot. The resulting assembly is as solid and rattle-free as any luxury car on the market. From the first turn of the wheel, we were amazed at the smooth, quiet performance. No longer must Corvette drivers cringe at approaching potholes or be distracted by annoying buzzes and shakes. It must simply be driven to be believed. And facing that lucky driver is a handsome set of analog, not digital, gauges. Smaller dials are set on different planes for a striking visual statement. All controls fall easily to hand, even at night, and all surfaces have a soft and expensive feel. Great care was taken in the details of this layout, and it shows. Driver and passenger will appreciate the increased leg and hip room and the more comfortable seats. Stretching the wheelbase by over eight inches and widening the track by three has freed up a lot of space. And space is what you'll find under the rear hatch also. Space for two golf bags or a real load of luggage. Liftover is still high by necessity, but access is easier through the wide, uncluttered opening. Choosing a power plant for the ultimate American icon is no easy task. For one thing the engineers knew for sure, it had to be a light, compact V8. There's just no mistaking the pushrod V8's lusty exhaust rumble and no substitute for its awesome low-end grunt. So evolved the LS1 engine. It's still a small block 350 at part, but an all-new aluminum design capable of 345 horsepower and 350 pound-feet of torque. Best of all, it does this while still delivering up to 28 miles per gallon on the highway. The Corvette delivers on the bottom line, too. The base price of $38,068 is practically unchanged from the model it replaces. Expect a new convertible soon while rumors persist about a lower-cost fixed-roof coupe. The 1997 Chevrolet Corvette is indeed here at last and stands as a proud testament to the passion and persistence of the engineers that coached it into being. 
So will enthusiasts embrace the new vet? Well, as far as we're concerned, the line starts right here. The very first Corvettes debuted in 1953 and were a sports car in name only. Their quasi-European styling belied their humble six-cylinder power and two-speed automatic transmission. As the 50s progressed, styling assumed a character of its own with a new body style to match its now standard V8 in 1956 and quad headlights for the 1958 model. In 1961, the now famous twin taillight clusters debuted on the well-received boat tail vets, which proved to be a harbinger of things to come. Corvette is certainly the image car for Chevrolet, but it's also much more. The Corvette platform has always been used as a test bed for engineering and manufacturing techniques that might trickle down to other General Motors cars. So the Corvette has seen a lot of evolution over four decades. Well, our resident Corvette aficionados, Pat Goss and Craig Singhaus, have been studying what's under the skin of the C5 and the path that got it there. 5.7 liters, 345 horsepower, 350 pound-feet of torque. Yeah, and over 170 miles an hour, Craig. This car is a far cry from the humble beginnings of the original Corvette. And humble's the right word. I mean, this engine was originally used in their trucks, right? That's right. And even by 1953 standards, the first year for the Corvette, you had only 140 net horsepower, even with the three carburetors. Of course, you've got a, the old slip and slide with Power Glide, a Power Glide two-speed automatic transmission, right? which is not exactly a sports car setup. Of course, in each corner, you've got drum brakes, which even compared to like an XK120 Jaguar, uh, this car did not slow down very well for the corners. Didn't make any difference, though. It didn't go around corners that well. <laughs> Yeah, it had an antiquated truck-derived suspension system using kingpins, Ooh, of all king things. Well, well, they made about 300 of them. They sold a little over half. Well, that probably would have been the end of it right there if it hadn't been for rumors of the Thunderbird coming on the scene. Well, I guess what the Corvette needed was a V8. Well, what they really needed was the input of Zora Arkus Duntov. Corvette got its V8 in 1955. Yeah, thanks to Mr. Duntoff. And in addition to that, it got a manual transmission. But only a three-speed. Only a three-speed. You know, Pat, by the late 50s, early 60s, you really start to see some neat stuff on Corvettes. Oh, yeah. The styling becomes more radical. The car is more sophisticated. Everything fits for a change. <laughs> yeah, but I was thinking more in terms of, like, 327 engines, uh, Rochester fuel injection, four and a floor with a four-speed. Well, all that's great, but the chassis was still pretty much the same. It had King kingpins. Pins, right. That's right. But all of that, it didn't prevent you from getting your kicks on Route 66. You know, Pat, whenever I think of a 1963 Corvette, I always think of Larry Shinoda's classic Corvette Stingray styling. Well, that's certainly a classic, but I think the true story is underneath that styling. Because this is Generation 2, and now we have four-wheel independent suspension. We have a transversely mounted leaf spring in the back that really makes these cars handle. You know, up front it's modern, too. I mean, you've got a double A-arm front suspension with ball joints, not, not the kingpins. Pins. That's right. And it didn't take long in Generation 2 before they had four-wheel disc brakes to harness all of this handling capability. But let's don't forget some of the most awesome engines anybody has ever made. Hey, how could I forget big blocks? I love big blocks. Well, that's a nice-looking 68. Yeah, it sure is, Craig. And, of course, here we're into Generation 3, and although these cars look radically different than the Generation 2 cars, underneath they're the same thing. You know, it's hard to believe that that basic chassis and the styling lasted until 1982. Hey, Pat, here's an 82. You know, it's funny. The, the very first Corvettes had trunks, but by C2, the second generation car, you had to kind of slip the luggage in from behind the seat. And that was typical of early third generation cars, too. But in 78, they came out with a fastback design like this. And then by 82, we have a hatchback. Like on this collector's edition. And that became a Corvette trademark. Pat, do you remember the excitement when the Generation 4 Corvette came out in 1983? Oh, I sure do. But remember, there were no 83 Corvettes. That's right. There were 84s. The thing is that there was just so much technology built into this basic chassis. Things like alloy suspension components attached to subframes, uh, a plastic composite uh, transverse leaf spring in the front and the rear. Oh yeah, and you add to that things like the spined chassis and then the explosion of electronics on these cars. 
just absolutely amazing. You have things like ABS brakes and uh, traction control, electronic suspension. These are tremendous cars. Yeah, but it's ironic. As, as fine as a car as this is, and I really do like them, there's the technology nowadays to create an even better handling car, a better riding car, and a car that's got better ergonomics inside. Oh, absolutely. And that's what brought us from this to C5. Okay, Pat, now I know you've owned over, what, 50 different Corvettes. Mm -hmm. You think there's one word that sums up what the new generation Corvette is always about? One word? Yes, progress, Craig. Each generation of Corvette is far better than the one that precedes it, and this one is fantastic. Chevrolet celebrated Corvette's first all-new chassis design with a dramatic new body style based on a previous Larry Shinoda show car design. Called the Stingray, Corvette featured fold-away headlights and for 1963, a split window design for the coupe. Convertible and coupe bodies were separate for the first time. While the split window disappeared by 1964, this basic body style, plus or minus some trim, remained unchanged through the 1967 model year. As early as 1965, Chevrolet styling had been playing with a highly customized Corvette known as the Mako Shark II. Many of the design themes were featured in the C3 generation Corvette when it debuted as a 1968 model. Although a year behind its original scheduled introduction date, the 68 vet with its power bulging fenders and coke bottle waist was well received. So well that the basic design continued for the next 14 years, acquiring body colored bumpers in the mid 1970s, as well as a fastback design by 1978. As they say in the aircraft industry, it looks good on paper, but will it fly? Well, now that we've seen the new Corvette and had a look at some of the engineering behind it, it's time to get serious. The real test for a car like this is how it performs under pressure. And to find out, we headed south to Savannah in our winter playground, Roebling Road Raceway. And it was here on the track that the new vet surprised and delighted us most. Now, we've always enjoyed our outings at Roebling Road, especially when a Corvette was involved. The C4 certainly entertained us with its tremendous grip, great throttle response, and predictability at the limit, but often earned low marks for vague steering, spongy brakes, and a heavy feel. Driving the same familiar corners now, the C5 Corvette portrays an entirely different character. The wider and longer stance belies a nimbleness and import-like response not felt on earlier vets. Initial turn-in invokes less understeer than before, but a deliberate throttle foot is all that's needed to coax the rear into play. Learn to use the gas wisely and the C5 will be your willing accomplice, urging you to push harder and rewarding those efforts with the thrill ride of a lifetime. The drive-by-wire throttle system surpasses the traditional linkage and faster response time, yet retains the familiar tension and feel. That, combined with a lighter clutch and our car's rear-mounted six-speed transmission, allowed zero to 60 sprints of 5.1 seconds. Quarter-mile dashes took a mere 13.6 seconds, ending at 106 miles per hour. Corvette engineers made every effort to deliver a car that responds to every wish and twitch of the wheel. So exiting corners at speed will likely induce some progressive tail swing, which is corrected by just the slightest modulation of throttle. We also wonder if the ultra-stiff sidewalls of the skinnier run-flat tires might not limit rollover and reduce breakaway limits in a small way. But on balance, there has never been a Corvette that has been more of a driver's car. Our car was equipped with the optional three-way suspension, but the stiffest performance calibration is actually equal to that of the standard Corvette suspension, so buyers of the base car are not really losing out on cornering ability. Club racers and other masochists will want to opt for the stiffer Z51 suspension set up for extended track work. The Corvette's newfound handling prowess comes directly from an all-new short long-arm suspension, coupled to an improved version of the transverse composite leaf spring. And since the basic structure of the car is so stiff, the suspension no longer has to compensate for flex in the car, resulting in a more purposeful setup and a big payoff in precision. Steering that is light on the street often translates to vague on the track, but not in this case. Using a variation of GM's luxury car, Magna Steer, the steering wheel now connects the driver to the road like never before. Feedback is almost telepathic, while damping of the normal shutters and thuds is well above par. 
And the same can be said for the brakes. Keeping our fun safely in check was an advanced Bosch ABS-5 four-wheel disc system. 114-foot stops from 60 were a snap. And slowing from triple-digit speeds was accomplished without fade or wander over hundreds of laps. Finding the right balance between road comfort and track performance is a tricky proposition for any car. And we must admit that knowing what a remarkable road car the 97 Corvette is, some of our drivers were prepared for a letdown on the racetrack. Happily for us, those predictions were wrong. The C5 truly is a world-class street and track star and should have drivers of more expensive hardware checking their mirrors very carefully. Veteran auto writer James Schefter's top secret odyssey inside General Motors is quite a story in itself, and his chronicle of the off and on eight-year development of the C5 Corvette is serious reading for any enthusiast. His book, All Corvettes Are Red, gives us a driver's eye view of every meeting, argument, obstacle, and triumph along the new vet's bumpy road to reality. From the first wild sketches and clay mock-ups to the proving grounds and the factory floor, no other book has described the genesis of a new car with this much startling detail.